Good morning, everyone. My name is Corey Berger. As a member of AJC's National Board of Governors and Chair of AJC's Women's Leadership Board, I am delighted to welcome you to this morning's AJC University session. It's hard to think of any institution in American life more vital than our universities. Their importance are even more appreciated in the Jewish community, for which higher education has always been an avenue to professional careers, upward social mobility, and full integration into American life. That very centrality of higher education in the hierarchy of values of American Jews makes us all the more alarmed at the reports about anti-Israel activities on many campuses around the country. Not only are there well-publicized campaigns to get student governments to pass motions calling on the administration to boycott, divest from, and sanction Israel, BDS, but a good number of faculty members are openly hostile to Israel, and resolutions have been proposed that professional academic associations should cut off all associations with their Israeli counterparts. Even more alarming, the atmosphere on some campuses is not just anti-Israel, but veers at times into anti-Semitism. This subject is not just an academic one for me. It hits very close to home for me as a parent, and I'm sure the same is true for many of you in the room today. It's about our children, their future, and the future of our community. It's why a small but committed group of AJC lay and staff leaders, including myself and my 16-year-old son, Ryan, have created the Leaders for Tomorrow, LIFT, program for high schoolers in the New York area. LIFT aims to prepare, inform, and train the next generation of global Jewish advocates before they enter the college campus. Many of us heard the harrowing story of Lauren Rogers yesterday. It's a story that still haunts me and begs the question, what more can the pro-Israel community do to fight BDS and project a more accurate picture of Israel and the challenges it faces? Three experts with considerable experience in this field have joined us this morning to suggest some solutions. Eric Fingerhut, President and CEO of Hillel International. Akiva Tor, Head of the Bureau for World Jewish Affairs at the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And Professor Alan Johnson, Senior Research Fellow at BICOM, the British Israel Communications and Resource Center. Moderating our conversation this morning is Dan Elbaum, AJC's Assistant Executive Director and Director of AJC's regional offices across the country. Dan also directs AJC's expanding campus and counter BDS efforts. I'd like to invite our esteemed panelists and moderator to take their seats now. Thank you. important, and I want to publicly acknowledge it once again and express my own personal gratitude. As someone whose kids are not quite thinking about college yet, but um, certainly, uh, hopefully, future members of the important initiative that you're starting. We have three panelists, and nobody talks about how great the moderator's opening was, so I'm going to turn it over to them <laughs> as quickly as possible, because they could all really command the entire time, and I already hear your complaints that there wasn't enough time for audience questions. <laughs> So Eric, if I can start with you, uh, and then quickly to go against my rules and say, is an introductory observation is that two, I think, crucial things that we've learned over the last few days are, first of all, the incredible international challenge that this is not restricted to campus. This is really a challenge that is exploding on the campus, but really affects everywhere around the world. And secondly, and to the point of introducing our panelists, is there are wonderful allies and wonderful people who are working on these issues, smart people who have devoted considerable thought to this subject. And then one of the first steps that many of us need to take is educating ourselves about the problem. So now, Eric, to start with you, and to try to be brief, is as bad as we think it is. Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to hear that 
uh, that there's been discussion over the course of the weekend uh, that this is truly an international challenge. Because I think the basic premise that we have to, uh, we have to approach this as we answer your question uh, is that this is an externally driven uh, movement uh, that is surely targeting campuses, uh, but therefore cannot be solved only by the campus. Uh, and, uh, and I want to thank AJC for its growing contributions uh, to this collective effort. Uh, by the way, I do need to, uh, to also say that these challenges on campus uh, are, of course, absorbed by our leaders on campus. And one of my colleagues, Brian Cohn, is here, who's the Hillel Director at Columbia Barnard Hillel. So please welcome Brian. Um, for, uh, for the leadership that they provide on campus. So, uh, uh, so recognizing that, the answer is, uh, the answer is, uh, is yes. Uh, this is a growing, uh, significant, real uh, challenge on campus that is infecting more and more, uh, more and more schools and impacting uh, uh, not only Jewish students on campus, but also, uh, but also the exposure that non-Jewish students have uh, to, uh, uh, to Israel. Uh, so uh, maybe the way to, to frame it, and, and, and I know, we, you know that we want to move on so that we can have more, uh, cover more topics, the way to frame it is why is campus a particular target uh, for, uh, for the BDS movement? Uh, and I would say that there's, uh, that there's two reasons uh, that we need to be aware of. One is uh, that, uh, that the BDS movement, the anti-Israel, the delegitimization forces, are playing the long game, right? So if, if, you're, if, if uh, an organization like, for example, SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine, which is the main organizing force of these activities on campus, uh, if they're promoting a student senate debate, student senate resolution on divestment, now, uh, you, you probably have my bio somewhere in, in a book. I, I used to work in higher education. I was the chancellor of the university system in Ohio. I know something about how higher education works. Last time I checked, the student senate doesn't actually control the investment policy of a university, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and in fact, no board of a university has divested or is going to divest because it would be a breach of their fiduciary duty uh, to actually divest from, uh, from business in Israel. Uh, but so these are purely uh, these are purely symbolic votes. Uh, but uh, but they are but what they're doing is they're forcing the campus into a debate about uh, uh, about uh, the uh, Israel from a negative slant, and so they're exposing students. Uh, and frankly, you know, I used to be in politics too. I was in Congress. I was in state legislature. I I I, I would love a political debate where you win if you win and you win if you lose. Right? And that's what they've got. Yeah. If they win, they win, uh, because they have the symbolic victory of a, of a university student government voting like in Northwestern or Stanford uh, you know, for BDS. Uh, and, but if they lose, they still engendered this whole negative conversation uh, that divided student governments. That's one reason why campuses are targeted. The second reason is, and I, and I really uh, I regret to say this, but they find, unfortunately, uh, an amplifying uh, effect on campus, meaning there are, uh, there are faculty and there are other organizations and supporters who will take the uh, pro-BDS message and amplify it on that campus. I sometimes say if you have a dollar to spend on anti-Israel activity, spend it on a campus because you'll get $10 worth uh, for your $1 uh, as opposed to the dollar you would spend somewhere else. So it's a particularly uh, hot house. It's a you know it's a it's an it's an environment uh, where this debate is often viewed as you know as part of the the, uh, the university uh, life. And so and so yes, it's a challenge. Um, uh, let me just uh, conclude this opening remark by saying, uh, together with the work of AGC, AJC and many other organizations, uh, we are working together. We are making progress. We are learning how to respond to these challenges. Uh, even as the challenges get more aggressive, there is a coordinated uh, uh, and increasingly, I think, effective response. More BDS resolutions lost than won this year. No, they've started the tactic of going to campus referendums. No campus referendum won. We defeated a campus referendum at Princeton, at Bowdoin, uh, and other places at DePaul. So we're working more effectively. We are learning uh, strategies and tactics. Uh, and, uh, and then the very last uh, comment I would say is, well, 
students are, are, are clearly an important part of this puzzle. And as members of the Jewish community in their own right, they, you know, we have, it's right for us to ask them and expect them to, to step up uh, and, and, and uh, help. Uh, we have to remember they are not soldiers, they are students. They are there to go to school uh, and, uh, uh, and, to, uh, and to enjoy themselves. Uh, and we cannot turn the four years of college into four years of, uh, of, uh, of, of war about Israel. Uh, and, uh, and, and we have a responsibility to speak up as a community to the university leaders as well, uh, to not allow them uh, to let universities be, uh, be overcome uh, by this kind of debate. It is, it is, it is destructive to, to, to uh, university life, to student life, uh, and we have a responsibility to speak clear to university leaders uh, who are uh, who are responsible for the quality of, uh, of student life on their campuses to make sure they know how destructive these movements are uh, to, uh, to overall student life. So we've got a, a, a role that this organization and others have to help us play in communicating to leaders of, of, of academic life to help us on this issue as well. Thank you. Uh, it, it is a privilege for AJC to work with Hillel International on these issues, and I know we're going to talk about other way, ways to work together as well. <laughs> Akiva, you offer something of a unique personal perspective, having seen this situation both in your former role as Council General in San Francisco, at the time where there was much of this going on, on the college campus, as we just discussed, right. and obviously from your current observations, where having some interaction with the issue from Jerusalem. I wonder if you can offer some general observations, both in the United States and abroad, and some general ideas about how to confront them. Well, I, I even have a, a deeper observation because I think like many of the people in this audience, I attended university in the United States. I, uh, I went to Colombia during the years of the first Lebanon war and made Aliyah immediately afterwards. And that was a very, very difficult period. The Israeli army was encircling Beirut. Sabra Shatila happened. And yet when I encountered as Council General in uh, in, in the Bay Area between 2008, 2012 and the divestment hearings in Berkeley, I felt really, I felt sad for the students because when I was back at university, even during those contentious times in the early 80s, uh, you could open yourself up. You could allow yourself to have a difficult debate in the dorm room. You could allow yourself to go to a course with Edward Said because you didn't have to worry that someone was going to try to kidnap the university and kidnap the, uh, uh, the student government in order to, to move the whole institution formally against Israel, or at least the appearance of that happening. So I have to say that I think the current situation is deeply sad because the students, we're now sending them to campus. Uh, you don't have to, you have to worry about whether, about their Jewishness, uh, about their, uh, about the, how they'll feel about Israel, but you also have to send them to, to fight a war uh, on campus. And it's not right. It's not the way it should be. And I don't think that the whole academic environment is, is, uh, is, is, acting, is reacting appropriately to this challenge, but I'll get to that. One thing that I learned, in um, one of the first places where divestment came up was at the UC Berkeley in 2009 and then in 2010. And uh, I was council general there. I was lucky to have a very skillful and devoted Hillel director, Adam Kelman, and, um, and wonderful students who were willing to really come together on this. It would, uh, the divestment was passed the first time because, of course, the BDS people, they, they called a snap vote when no one was around. Then uh, there was a re-vote, then the student president uh, vetoed it, and then it was defeated. The, uh, in, in other words, in 2010, divestment was defeated in, at Berkeley. And there was a feeling that this was a huge accomplishment. The following two years afterwards, Hillel made sure to run student government lists, and the student government of Berkeley was, such, was, a, was, was constructed in such a way that there was no way that divestment uh, would, would pass. I go back to Israel, and I read the paper, and I don't know if it was 2000, 2013 or 2014. Lo and behold, uh, UC Berkeley divests from Israel. And that made me realize something. It made me realize that it's, uh, we're in a situation where the tactical battles are against us because we're like fighting. There's a sea out there which is never going to move away. And therefore, we need to find a way to lower the level of the ocean and not just decide how we're going to do this tactically. And um, 
that brings me to two issues, if I can mention them very briefly. The, something that I always felt was really lacking during the divestment hearings was, you know, the Jewish students were in the room, and the anti uh, the anti Israel Jewish professors were in the room, but the normal Jewish faculty were not in the room. Not the junior faculty and not the senior faculty. They were. Except for a few people, they were really nowhere to be found. They said it wasn't their issue. And I, it was horrendous. The university president, the university presidents were not around. And uh, they said, you know, we're just going to let this take its course. And here I think that we need to, uh, take, to look at the BDS issue not only tactically, but also strategically, what do we want to do? I think we need to create a situation where on campus there will be much more Israel studies, much more, many more Israel academic events taking place publicly. We cannot allow a situation where an Israeli diplomat is not allowed to speak on campus, which is essentially the situation right now. And I think that we have to listen very carefully to uh, some of the speeches by the former president of Harvard, Larry Summers, because I think he's shown some real moral and uh, moral clarity on this issue. He's basically, he gave two addresses, and I don't want to, I want to stop now, but uh, so I'll quote from them later on during the questions and answers. But essentially, the position of Larry Summers is that the academic community as a whole has abdicated moral responsibility by allowing a situation of anti-Israel McCarthyism on campus. And we have to find a way in which we get the university presidents, senior faculty, Jewish faculty, to understand these things so that we will have a strategic environment which is much less hospitable to, uh, to these BDS initiatives. Thank you. Uh, Alan, AJC is privileged to work with your organization, BICOM. It is a true partner across the ocean. And to share a perhaps unfunny and definitely inappropriate joke uh, that the British definition of an anti-Semite is someone who hates the Jews more than necessary. Uh, more, than, more than absolutely necessary. More than absolutely necessary. But there is a general American sense that as bad as the situation is in the United States, it's worse in, in the United Kingdom, especially at the university level with boycotts and recent news of this. I wonder if I could ask you to comment for a few minutes about the current situation, both as it's playing out and a little bit about the intellectual arguments that are used. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, when I was... Um, I have AJC Envy, I should say, for a start. I've been here three days, and it's just a fantastic event and a fantastic organization. I look forward to building the relationship between our, our, our two organizations. Um, but when I was coming over to America, a friend, American friend said to me, um, you're making some speeches. Don't worry about it. You've got a British accent, and you're speaking in America, so you can, you can get away with it. <laughs> And um, this must be true because there's an advertising campaign going on at the moment in the London tube system to attract people to come and visit Las Vegas. <laughs> and the slogan on the adverts is, come to a place where your voice is an aphrodisiac. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Anyway. Okay, next question. But, uh... <laughs> false advertising. <okay. laughs> Definitely false advertising. But look, can, can you hear? Sorry? Someone will, someone will tell them what you said. Oh, okay. um, so look, I think in terms of how bad things are, I would say I'm going to steal this line from my friend, the, the, the Israeli ambassador to London, Daniel Taub. We should take the first line of a Charles Dickens novel. It, it is the best of times. It is the worst of times. So one in six drugs to the British National Health Service is supplied from Israel. 2014, between January and September alone, 26% increase in trade. Trade has doubled in four years. Cinema cooperation, cultural cooperation, military security cooperation. So that's, that's a fantastic story to be told about the Britain-Israel relationship. But nonetheless, uh, um, last week we had the National Union of Students vote to boycott Israel. Now this was the same National Union of Students executive who, when they were faced with a resolution to condemn ISIS, refused to condemn ISIS on the grounds that it would promote possibly Islamophobia. So, so the worst of times in some cases too. So, so I want to say a few words about why I think we've reached this situation. And I think there's, we, maybe we haven't fully taken the measure of our opponent yet. And how, as we've heard, they play the long game and they're very skilled at it. I think the, 
BDS movement has three things we need to acknowledge and then fight against. One is, over a long period of time, they've built up a kind of intellectual dominance, certainly inside some campuses. So public intellectuals, academics have spent decades building up a set of concepts to understand Israel, which act as a kind of prison for the mind. And the students are placed inside that prison. So if you want to think about Israel on campuses, what you'll come across is the idea that Zionism is racism. It's a settler colonialism. There was an ethnic cleansing in 1948. It went on to build an apartheid state. And it's now engaged in, and this is Ian Pape's term, an Israeli academic now at Exeter University, Israel's engaged in an incremental genocide against the Palestinian people. If, if you live inside that prison, it's pretty natural to then end up thinking I should boycott Israel and so on and so forth. So they have that. The second thing they have, and we touched on this, is they have a real social movement. They have a movement of quite experienced activists who are able to take those general concepts and translate them into the specific language of the Methodist Church, the language of the British Labour Party, the trade union movement, the NGOs. And I think it's that combination of the public intellectuals, intellectual dominance, and the, the, the social movement that's so powerful. I would make one, one last point, and maybe it's a little controversial, we'll see, which is I think the other thing the BDS movement sometimes has is an Israeli political class that doesn't quite yet understand how to meet the challenge of BDS. By which I mean a couple of things. I mean, in the UK, there's a kind of consensus around you know, what the settlement should look like. There's, there's no sense that there's anything on offer. There's no sense that Israel should rush to it. But there's a sense that you know, two states for two peoples is where we, we, we think it's reasonable to be. I think when Israel is seen to be in that space too, even though it's saying we don't have security guarantees, we don't have a negotiating partner, there's no deal to be made, there's real security threats, BDS will remain a fringe movement. If, for unfair reasons, for perceptions, Israel's perceived to leave that space, I think a couple of things happen. One is BDS gets the chance to mainstream its explanation, which is that Israel isn't serious about peace, so therefore you need outside pressure upon Israel, and it's able to mainstream its tactics. Of BDS and so on. So I think Israel needs, in terms of its rhetoric and its tone, it needs to acknowledge that getting on the front foot, reminding people about the problems of the Palestinians as a partner, the real security threats it faces, the reason why we're in an impasse in the peace process is hugely important. And there was an article in the Times of Israel which said sometimes left and right in Israel can be a little bit, can, they can treat the BDS issue as something to do domestic political positioning on and, and speak to their base. So these days, everyone's obsessed with Israel, and it's a 24-hour media culture. So there's no such thing anymore, I don't think, as speaking to your base and thinking you can speak in a different way publicly later. Every dog whistle goes around the world, and the whole world is watching. So I think there's a, there's a real challenge there for Israel, Israeli politicians, Israeli diplomats, to, to meet the challenge of BDS at that level too. So I think we need a response on all these levels. We need a serious response to the intellectual challenge we face. We need to build up a social movement capable of challenging theirs. And maybe we need to be a little bit smarter about public communications coming out of, um, of Israel too. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, and it, I wouldn't be a moderator if I didn't try to seize on the controversy that you've just created and, and to ask Eric and Akiva your, your views on this. You do hear from time to time, if only Israel did X, maybe the situation would be different in that sense. And the powerful counter narrative, of course, that doesn't matter what Israel would do in this situation. These groups are ideologically where they are and they would find a reason to oppose and one only needs to look at the different treatment Israel receives as opposed to the other community of nations and their conduct. But from your perspective with the campuses and the larger lens, Eric, I, I, could, d what role does Israel's public actions and public statements play here? I, I think it can help on the margins. Um, I, I think uh, uh, you know, certainly there is a broad center uh, of, uh, uh, of Jewish uh, life in America, and this is reflected on campus, uh, who are largely uh, progressive in their outlook uh, you know, uh, want to see peace, want to see uh, uh, social justice uh, in, uh, in Israel as well as at home. Uh, and, uh, uh, and when there is, uh, and when there are incidents in Israel and, and, or, or, or speeches or comments that, uh, that, uh, that undermine that, 
uh, that surely those things uh, uh, give, um, uh, give some additional uh, pause to, to people who would otherwise be part of your mainstream coalition. But, but I have to say that I, I found Alan's other points more compelling, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, candidly, uh, you know, than, than the last one. And, 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 also, uh, and also Akiva made the same point. Uh, and, that is, uh, and that is to appreciate the extent to which the, uh, uh, the, the anti-Israel uh, intellectual construct has come uh, you know, has come to be prevalent uh, within certain segments of academia. It's, it's always, uh, uh, by the way, I, you know, I, I should have made the point, I, I, I regretted as soon as I finished not making the point, uh, 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 my earlier comments about the diversity of higher education, right? This is an incredibly diverse ecosystem. So we're not speaking about all schools. We're not speaking about all, all you know, all disciplines. Uh, my favorite example recently of this is the same week the University of Texas at Austin student government had a big battle over a divestment resolution um, that we thankfully defeated, but it was, you know, it was a serious fight. The uh, Texas A&M student government passed a resolution asking for more investment uh, in Israel, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, but the, you know, the, the, point, the point wasn't to, to get an applause line, the point was to show that campuses are incredibly diverse. Uh, by the way, uh, this is also located more, more deeply in certain disciplines in the academy than in other disciplines. Some of you may have followed the incident at University of Illinois this year uh, where a professor was denied tenure uh, in part because of his virulently uh, anti-Semitic and anti-Israel um, uh, 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 social media comments and such. Uh, and there were two letters written to the uh, Board of Trustees of the University, one supporting the decision to deny tenure uh, from professors, I should have said, from the faculty, one employment, employment, employment. Thank you. One, one supporting and one opposing, uh, and 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 by and large, those supporting were from the hard sciences and the hard, uh, you know, uh, uh, the sciences and engineering, etc., math, medicine, and those opposing were largely in uh, in the humanities and social sciences and the you know uh, ethnic studies and gender studies and and so if you're in a university a small liberal arts college where those are the predominant uh, disciplines uh, and there's less of the other uh, disciplines you're going to get a different mix uh, than you are so uh, I, I think that this is a uh, that this is an aspect of this uh, of this uh, work that is incredibly important uh, Kiva touched on it as well um, and, uh, and, and for us to become more sophisticated about how to communicate with universities about what is happening to the academic climate, not about defending Israel, what is happening to the academic climate uh, and the intellectual climate uh, of, uh, of these universities uh, is, is a point that both Alan and Akiva made that you know, that I would significantly underscore, and I think there's a role for, uh, for, uh, for AJC in that. Uh, you, you have to, you have to, I mean, I, look, I'm the president of Hillel. Uh, this is the Jewish student organization. Uh, uh, we have to appreciate what is an appropriate role for students and an expectation for students and what is not. Uh, what, what the government of Israel and, and global Jewish organizations can't accomplish, what the foreign ministry of Israel can't accomplish, it is unlikely that student groups on campus uh, are going to accomplish. And conversely, uh, we still uh, are working with young people uh, who our first obligation to them is to help strengthen Jewish identity, build connections to the Jewish community. Remember, this is, this is the first time they've been away from home, the first time they've been, uh, they've been on their own, making their own decisions. Uh, until they went to college, if, you, if, your fa if your family brought you to community and involved you in community, then you were involved in the Jewish community. If your family brought you to synagogue, you were involved. Now it's your own, uh, your own time to make your own decisions about involvement. Uh, in, in Jewish life. Uh, as much as we'd like to, we can't order them to do that. Um, so we have to model it and we have to inspire it. That's what Brian and his colleagues uh, do every day. Uh, and you understand that that modeling and inspiring can't be entirely around a negative, uh, uh, around a narrative of, uh, of attack 
uh, and uh, uh, you know, an anti-Semitism. It has to be around a narrative of positive building of Jewish identity and Jewish, uh, and Jewish communal activities. It is part of your responsibility to stand up as part of the community. We need to teach that, but if that cannot be the entire, uh, the entire focus. And so this broader lens that both Akiva and Allen have, have uh, supported, uh, and which I think AJC understands, is something that I very much hope we'll all take seriously. Thank you. Akiva. Uh, so I, I agree with Alan's point, controversial point only, only halfway, in the sense that uh, it's, it's I, 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 me too. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, you know it's always easier on campus when if the Israeli government is a, a left government or you know a government which is closer uh, to uh, uh, to certain positions, but uh, that it makes it easier for the Jewish students primarily. The BDS movement, I don't think they really care. Uh, and I think also, when you take all the tactical things together, it's, it's important, but only to a certain extent. I'll give an example. Uh, the BDS movement began at Harvard in 2002, uh, in the heart of the Second Intifada, right after the failure of the Barak Initiative, when, uh, when uh, suicide bombers were blowing up in all of Israel's cities every day. It didn't keep uh, 700 or 500 uh, academics at Harvard signing a BDS petition at that time. Uh, when I was dealing with the, some of the BDS activists, you know, you would talk about Oslo. They're not interested in Oslo. The people, the Palestinian leadership that signed uh, the Oslo Accords are collaborationists with Israel. They're war criminals of the Palestinian people. So, you know, it, it only takes you so far. And uh, I remember very sadly when uh, Ehud Olmert was hosted after he finished his premiership at the World Affairs Council in San Francisco, Jewish Voice for Peace and other groups came to heckle him. This is a, a guy who made an offer of a return of 94% of the West Bank uh, to the Palestinian Authority for the establishment of a Palestinian state. And the one thing that the academic in the room who was invited to meet with him beforehand was, I look forward to seeing you in the docket in The Hague. So, <clears throat> I, I, so I, I do think that, <clears throat> of course, it's easier within the general, when, uh, but should take it so far. And it's always better when Israeli Hasbara is better. Of course, we, we, all, we all know that. I do think that we have to focus both AJC and Hillel, and Israel government, and whatever they talked about in Las Vegas, <laughs> on, on um, <clears throat> affecting university professors and university uh, senior university ad administrative leadership, because they all disagree with BDS, they don't like it, it kills their donor base, they know it's wrong, but they're not showing moral courage. And therefore, we have to do more, I think, to bring them together, to bring them to Israel, to convene them in the Catskills, I don't know where, but they, to get them to stand up and be counted and call this what it is, which is a kind of a new McCarthyism. Well, and I just, if I can add real quickly to that, uh, yes, moral courage, but also effective strategies and tactics that they can implement um, that, you know, that, that, sure. that would make a difference within the unique context and governmental operations, the way universities operate. And, and that's something Hillel certainly is, is working uh, with universities to do increasingly. Uh, look, we are, we're unique in that we live on campus, right? Brian is on campus every day. Our colleagues and professionals uh, are on campus. We, it is one of our, one of the checklists of a good Hillel director like Brian is to build a relationship with the Dean of Student Life and the Dean of, of, of Religious Life and the Provost's office and the, you know, so, so we have those internal relationships. They now have to be, uh, you know, leveraged in a more sophisticated way uh, to help them understand what is, what is frankly happening to student life, how this is tearing apart student life uh, and tearing students against each other uh, and, uh, and what effective strategies they can take. I don't think this is something we have spent a lot of time uh, thinking about, uh, but it is certainly something, look, I had 16 of Brian's colleagues were at our office here in DC the last two days to have this very discussion. What did we learn this year uh, and what can we be 
uh, what can we do more effectively uh, next year? So uh, this, this is an important realm of, of, of getting, the, you know, what Akiva is speaking about, getting the university to think about this, not that they have to defend Israel, but they have to defend the academic integrity of an institution, and they have to defend the opportunity of every student to participate uh, in the academic life of an institution without feeling personally uh, you know, uh, put upon uh, in, their, in their religious views or their personal political views. Thank you. So let me ask my, my final question before turning over to you for your questions. And we have two people with microphones, so if you're yearning to ask that burning question, try to get their attention right now as, as we answer. And we will try to, not, not this second, but okay. All right, I did say that. Okay, so. money for auction off the Not bad idea. Well, not so, for Hello. And, and, and I'll start with Alan, and I'll ask you to keep this brief because we just saw the flash of hands and, and the amount of questions that we will have. Is AJC is an advocacy organization, and an advocacy an advocate obviously has goals in mind, but is also very conscious of the audience before which he or she appears. And although the principles and the goals remain the same, the argument is tailored to resonate with that particular audience. Uh, starting with you, Alan, but I'd really love to hear from all of you, see if you could share some observations about which arguments are most effective in your particular area and which are the least. Okay. Um, I think the first thing I would say almost as a prior to that is engage. I think for a long time we've been a little bit reluctant to engage with our opponent, um, maybe allowed them to dominate the room completely and have own, sorry, own, I think maybe we need to engage with our opponent first of all, certainly maybe we haven't done that enough. When you do engage, you get huge breakthroughs. So I was debating with Norman Finkelstein in London recently and he told the audience, Hamas do not have rockets, Hamas have only fireworks. That's what I told them. There's 400 people in the audience at a London university, and I was able to say, look, initially they were pretty crude and they popped over the border, they were bad enough. Now there's Faj 5 missiles supplied from Iran, which reached 70 kilometers to Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And what happened next is they all laughed. The audience of students at a London university at that point all laughed at me, which is a, it's good. When you engage, you understand what they know and what they don't know which helps you for the next time. So I was able to say, look, only in this bubble you've created of the Israel-Palestine debate on campus could the sentence I've said to it. So engage first of all. I think the second point I would say is make your arguments resonant with the values of the audience you're addressing. And Israel can do that. Israel's case is strong enough to always resonate with, maybe, maybe this is coming from the left, so with the progressive values of the audience that you're addressing. So we've got a good case to make before trade unions. We've got a good case to make before the Labour Party. And this was, I guess, to, to revisit that point, one of the things we have to do is put a kind of intellectual firewall up, a firewall of argument that keeps the fringe as the fringe. And that was my point before, that certainly that, that hardcore is always going to demonize Israel. It's always going to not give it a break and try to produce you know, boycotts and sanctions and so on. Our challenge, I think, is in our engagement with those people, how do we win the argument sufficiently so they remain a fringe and they don't get to bleed into the mainstream? I've watched the British Labour Party over the last number of years. At the fringe meetings at the British Labour Party conference, the platform starts off narrow with the Palestine Solidarity Campaign and maybe a, a, a far left figure. And as the years have gone by, the platform has got wider and wider and wider. Mainstream trade unionists, former Labour Party cabinet ministers and others, and the room has got bigger and bigger. So we have an issue which is, as, as bad-intentioned as the fringe are, as malevolent as they are, they are making progress. I wouldn't say more than that, but making progress mm -hmm. towards the mainstream. I think our challenge is what arguments work best to keep them a fringe. And I think it's the case for peace, mutual recognition, coexistence, and compromise, and, and we have a very strong case to make from 36 to 45 to 47 to 67 to Camp David to Annapolis that Israel is serious about peace, and the other side are not. We need to remind people about Palestinian rejectionism, Palestinian terrorism, Palestinian incitement. We need to knock the Palestinians off their perch to some extent. The debate in the UK is often one of a innocent Palestine against a guilty Israel, an all-powerful Israel against a, a weak and innocent Palestine. We need to give agency back to the Palestinians, responsibility back to the Palestinians, and knock them off that perch. If we can do that kind of thing, I think we can stop the fringe from bleeding into the mainstream. Thank you. Akiva? I think, in, I, think in, uh, I had the opportunity to study for a year in England, and I think it's very much like you described it. But in the United States, I do think that the BDS movement 
is more uh, similar to the Bolshevik party in the sense that they're, they're not convincing, they're, uh, but they're tactically adept and they'll do anything to win. And therefore, uh, I, I agree it is bleeding into certain parts and certain sectors of the mainstream, but uh, I think it has to be defeated and called for what it is and we have to get, we have to get academic leadership to stand up on it. I also think that within our own community, we have to, uh, we cannot afford internal fighting. What Naftali Bennett called shooting within the armored personnel carrier. It became a, pos uh, became a very popular campaign slogan. And, uh, but what he meant is there can't be uh, inner uh, Jewish strife when we're dealing with this. And I can tell you that on campus it happens a lot. There are, there are donors from who are very, very, much to the right, who, uh, who will threaten the Hillel director if he or she does this or that, and who is doing their very best to defeat this. And we have to have a united front, and we have to, we have to pull together in the face of this. Eric? Um, well, I, I actually, I think that Alan's uh, last point, that, um, that making the strong case for uh, Israel's uh, um, love of peace, desire of peace, uh, you know, uh, uh, search for peace would certainly be helpful. There's no question. There is, there, there is a lack of, there is an ahistorical uh, quality to the, uh, you know, to the debate. Uh, I bet if you ask people if they even know what countries Israel has a peace treaty with, uh, you know, in the Middle East, they probably don't know. I mean, there's, there's lots of, you know, there's, there's lots of facts missing here. Um, and, uh, and I certainly think uh, it could be helpful. Uh, but, but I do also, uh, you know, come back to, uh, to the unique nature of the university community in which we live. Uh, and, uh, and I think some of the other tactics and strategies that Akiva and I have, have mentioned previously uh, are, uh, you know, need to be there. I also, look, I would just not be doing my job in a room like this uh, if I didn't say that, uh, I, I feel like I should go back to uh, Alan's, uh, you know, it's the, the best of times, the worst of times uh, comment and tell you uh, that Jewish life on campus uh, is robust. And is uh, and is exciting and is engaging, um, and uh, if we want to have a community that can respond to these kinds of uh, of challenges to the Jewish people, we first have to have a community, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, and building community on campus uh, is uh, uh, is what Hillel does, uh, and uh, and so uh, if we want uh, if we want uh, to be strong enough. Uh, as a Jewish community on campus to, uh, to be able to shoulder the responsibility that comes with these challenging times we live in, we have to be a strong community. Um, and so, uh, you know, to, to Akiva's uh, quoting Naftali Bennett about shooting within the, uh, you know, the, uh, the armored carrier, the, the personnel carrier, so maybe we'll have disagreements on strategy and tactics about, uh, about Israel, but we cannot allow that to bleed over uh, into not wanting to, in a unified way, support and build the organizations on campus that are building broader Jewish life. There are many organizations that will come to our aid uh, on, uh, on, the Israel, uh, on the Israel issue, the Israel debate, including, thank, you know, thankfully, AJC. Uh, but only Hillel is building community and then trying to mobilize that community to help, uh, you know, to, you know, to help respond. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, I, I need to make sure we understand that our responsibility is, uh, you know, yes, we're there to uh, be a part of this incredibly important response to a, a, a really what is an existential challenge to, uh, to, you know, to the Jewish people, but we can only do that if we're strong as a community in the first place on campus. Thank you. So let's open it up for questions. Wow. We are going to take three at a time, let me give my yearly disclaimer that a question is a short statement <laughs> aimed to elicit a response from the panelists, as opposed to an extensive speech followed by, do you agree with me? <laughs> so <clears throat> so uh, first question over there. Yes, please. Is there currently uh, a readily accessible 
set of written materials that students on campus can access and deploy in responding to the stereotypical BDS propaganda. And if there isn't such a currently accessible written set of materials, shouldn't there be? Yes. Uh, the, the, Let's do a few more, and then we'll... Okay, we'll, we'll sure. um, wow, it's too much responsibility. <laughs> uh, do you agree? I'll just uh, go to the, the back. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, uh, similar to the last question, um, the program is billed as effective strategies for dealing with BDS, and from what I've heard so far, I haven't really heard tangible, effective strategies that are that that can be implemented now by our kids. I have one in college and a whole bunch on the runway ready to go, and and, and tangible of what we could do. We understand what the problem is, and part of the problem is that we keep talking about the problem, but what specifically do you each recommend, three points perhaps each, of what needs to happen by us and by the students? Okay, and for the final question, Nati? Yeah. Um, Debbie and I just got back from uh, Las Vegas from the anti-BDS conference. Uh, I must say, that uh, I like the questions that, that were presented better than the presentation right now. Um, <clears throat> because what came out of it is that, while, what came out of it is that we need to go on the attack. We have described what's going on for 14 years. I've been involved in anti-BDS activity for 14 years. And obviously being on our heels has not worked. AJC, to its credit, and people don't know that, were instrumental behind passing a legislative action in the state of Illinois, the same as recently was passed by Southern uh, Carolina, which is outlawing BDS, getting around First Amendment issue and so on wasn't an easy thing. This is one strategy that could be employed. So with the idea of being proactive, what do you see uh, that it could be done to go on the offense. And by the way, Israel just appropriated uh, something like 200,000, uh, 200 million shkalim to dedicate to this very serious problem. It's our problem, it's on our watch, and we have failed Israel so far. We need to turn, turn the tide, and it's much easier done than uh, it seems to be. All we need to do is a plan of action. Thank you. Okay, so the question says, I heard it, accessible materials, yeah. one, effective strategies, and going on the attack. Uh, sure. I'll start. So the answer is there are many sets of effective materials uh, because there are many organizations that are, uh, that are concerning themselves with assisting students in dealing with this issue. They come from all different perspectives. Um, as do students. So there's not going to be any one set of talking points, with all respect, that every student is going, to, uh, is going to pick up and read. No more than the adult Jewish community, the, the post-college Jewish community would read from one set of talking points. Our students are going to read from one set of talking points. Uh, we welcome the organizations that provide those kinds of, uh, of, of assistance. With uh, reference to Kiva's point, we wish they would stop attacking each other and attacking students who choose to adopt talking points from a different group uh, that uh, they wish were more nuanced in, in the way they want. Uh, and uh, to my point about community, uh, I will tell you that after every organization uh, provides, you know, organizes two or three or four or however many students they're able to on campus, um, you know, they, uh, all those students come to Hillel uh, and they say to the people like Brian and others, what do I make of this set of talking points I got from this group and this set of talking points I got from that group? And then they try to, on their own, as they should because they are students and we want them to learn how to lead, uh, they then, on their own, assimilate those things together into uh, the presentations that they are going to make under the guidance of 
the very talented educational leaders uh, that we have on campus. So anybody who thinks, and there were some people in various gatherings recently who think that there's one set of, of you know, we can present one set of talking points that students will just adopt if only we were the, uh, organized enough, think whether that works in your synagogue, think whether that works in your, uh, you know, in your communities, uh, and then you'll know how it's not going to work on campus. Number two, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the idea of, uh, of effective strategies. I think we have, uh, we have mentioned some that are promising here, but I'll, I'll, I'll repeat them. Uh, uh, and, then amp and then itemize them one, two, three, as was asked. Number one, I think we've all agreed on this stage that there has to be, and there, there is starting to be effective communications with university leaders, and that has to be, uh, that has to be advanced in a much more s significant and sophisticated way. I mentioned uh, that, uh, that there is increasing cooperation among all the organizations that are working on campus with students, and that we are becoming more effective working collectively in response to the BDS resolutions. We, we won more than we lost this year. We beat the referendums on campus. We're using political organizing strategies, and I urge you to support those kinds of efforts that are already coalescing to work and not, as some would like to do, start a whole nother effort, uh, but work with those organizations that are on campus and are make learning and making progress. Thirdly, one that hasn't been mentioned, uh, but I think it's alluded to in Alan's comments about peace. Uh, making the case for peace is, we know that by and large, college age students uh, are progressive in their outlook. Many of them are also coming from homes and families and, uh, and uh, synagogues and Jewish, uh, 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 you know, uh, theological denominational movements that are progressive uh, and focused on social justice in their orientation. Uh, the Jew if the Jewish community voted probably 65, 75% for uh, President Obama, uh, college campuses probably voted 80, 90 percent. Uh, so we have to realize, appreciate their where they're coming from, and the opportunity. One of the challenges we're facing, which I believe Alan alluded to or Akiva alluded to, is the unfortunate building of coalitions on the left from other, uh, you know, racial justice issues. You've all seen Ferguson equals Palestine. Have you seen those signs? Uh, and uh, you know, the environmental movement and these other movements that are coalescing on the left and joining the anti-Israel movement. We seriously uh, have to find more effective strategies for reaching progressive students and helping support them uh, and helping them articulate their view of social justice and have it in a way that is aligned with uh, with support for Israel. This is a huge missing link. We had Ari Shavit, for example, Hillel sponsored Ari Shavit on 23 campuses this year uh, at, uh, at Hillel. And I can, I can only tell you how many times I got emails from our colleagues on campus thanking us for sending a speaker uh, you know, who's, who's a Zionist, uh, but also comes as a voice with credibility on the left because most of the faculty and most of the students come from that perspective. So more, more communications, candidly, from the right aren't going to be, uh, uh, aren't gonna be uh, uh, the solution on campus. Finding more ways to speak uh, in, the, in the voice of progressive students, uh, but leading them uh, in, you know, to understand the real challenges is a solution we need to pursue more deeply. Thank you. Akiva. Okay. <clears throat> in, uh, in, in line with Eric's uh, practicality as we've been asked to be. I would say number one, it, open your minds and imaginations, all of us. If you really want to think about this, the next time you hear that your son or daughter or, or grandchild is on a campus where a divestment hearing is going on, fly down or drive down and attend it. You'll be shocked and you'll understand all of a sudden that many of the ideas that you thought would work are completely impractical. It's, it's a parallel universe and it's not like the world in which you and I are living. It's campus in, in, with, without aphrodisiacs, but with hallucinogens. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, political hallucinogens. Legislation, if it will work, fine. But I'm deeply skeptical that these, uh, that these legislative efforts will, will pass a state Supreme Court or a federal Supreme Court. I, I, we, we can use legislation to divest from Iran at the level of states, but, and it was used, but you know, if it'll work, fine, but I, I just don't think it, personally, I, I'm not a constitutional expert, but everyone I've spoken to has told me it doesn't have a, doesn't have a chance. Maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong. Materials, there are tons of materials. There are seven 
organiz organizations on campus sending the wrong students to Israel. They're, they're sending the Israel students as Hasbara fellows instead of sending the Hispanic and Afro-American students who need to be visiting Israel. So uh, I think it, it's very important that, that there's a lot of energies now for bringing together and coalescing and bringing together resources like Hammond at this meeting and like Hillel's trying to do and many other people are trying to do. But I do think that our students have to move beyond materials and talking points. Talking points, I must tell you, are not very effective because the other side also has talking points. And so whose talking points are correct? The only way to stand uh, in, a, in a challenging environment is to have intellectual self-confidence and belief in your own knowledge. And I think that in, at every level of Jewish education in the United States and in Britain, uh, in the day schools, in the Hebrew schools, at camps, we need to, I personally think we need to stop talking about Israel advocacy. We need to start talking about Israel education. People cannot, uh, we, we need to train students so that they will have a desire to stand up for Israel. And they won't do it because someone has put talking points in their hands, but because they believe what is happening is outrageous and they know it's outrageous because they actually know the history of Israel. So we all have to work, uh, it's, you know, I, I often, I said to students at Berkeley, I said, you know, you, you may be an uh, art history major, you know, but you don't have the, at this time in real history, you don't have the luxury of not studying political history. You have to know the history of Israel because uh, we're in a challenged environment and, and, and you have to know. Specifically, some steps that we can take. I, I think that we have to find a way, and I don't absolve the foreign ministry from this, I think we all have to work together. We should try to be bringing 50 to 60 uh, uh, university presidents to Israel a year, not 10. Uh, um, and we have to have much, many, many more Israel chairs and dedicated faculty to teaching Israel academically, in particular on critical campuses. And we need to be investing on conferences of Jewish faculty, not only right-wing Jewish faculty, all Jewish faculty, so they can have a sense of community and begin understanding that they're also abdicating to a certain extent their responsibilities. And uh, something which it's possible that Hillel is already doing, but I do think that on critical campuses there need to be dedicated resources so that there will be, um, so, so that student governments will not be controlled by, by, by wrong, uh, by, by very, very anti-Israel groups. But that's something better not spoken about, frankly. So thank you. And uh, Alan, with apologies, I'll let you take the first of the next uh, series of three questions. And if there's any point you want to clean up, I will just say, to, uh, to your point, and I take it very well, that sometimes we send the wrong students to Israel. Uh, sometimes we do send the right ones. And many of us heard last night, all of us heard last night, Lauren Rogers, who we're actually privileged to have in the room today. And I want to acknowledge <laughs> the presence of you. Thank you. Okay, uh, three more questions. There. Hello, my name is Alexis Algeria. I'm from New York City, originally from West by God, Virginia. And I've been working with the anti-BDS movement for the past eight years. I would like to thank our panelists up there for their comments and their dedication to this issue. It's very real. I would like to make three things that were not touched upon. One is our allies. Some of our biggest allies are the evangelical evangelical Christians in the South, and you see that in University of Texas. I was quite shocked at Duke University and UVA when we brought law students because the BDS movement has now become mainstream with the law schools. We visited 20 law schools, and many of the questions from the law students were, why is Israel occupying Palestine? Now, when you have second and third year law students taking this in, we have we are using um, high-ranking IDF uh, personnel to combat this on campus. We're bringing law students to Israel so they can see Israel and also talk and see how diverse it is, how Israel is that. The, my question is, how are you doing alliances? What, how are you doing bringing the students over because we have to do more of that? 
And who are the alliances that Hillel and BICOM and Mr. Tor, your organization, how are you working with those alliances? And how are you strengthening them? Because no matter what side of the political spectrum that we're on, we do have to work together. It's very serious. Thank you. It, it's an important question. And thank you for the important work that you're doing. Uh, second question. Hi, Jessica Cohen from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I'm the managing director of community relations for the Federation there. And I think I spent about 75% of my time working on this. The question is really to jump on what Eric was saying, and I'm hoping, Akiva, you can give some information as well. But we are feeling like we are losing a lot of the students before they even get to the BDS question because of their, the anti-establishment progressive thoughts that students get on campus, as they rightfully should. But how do we engage with Israel? And I know that we do a lot of bringing in speakers and things like that, but how do we engage in nuance? How do we how do we acknowledge mistakes, perhaps, that the Israeli government has made without opening up the dialogue for anti-Israel and anti-Semitic rhetoric, but still allow for these progressive students to engage in a way that they feel allows, that they feel the establishment is listening to them? Thank you. One more question. I, I point. <laughs> Hi, Jane Wolanski, Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, I think we're all acknowledging that the BDS movement ties in with this greater movement of McCarthyism, thought policing, which I have three college-age kids. It's far more extensive than is reported and that you would ever realize. But this all ties in with the question of what constitutes not freedom of speech, but academic freedom. And I'm wondering if one of you can perhaps set forth a guideline, because we don't like it when SJP invites a speaker from Hamas to come speak, or a terrorist, or, you know. On the other hand, um, you know, uh, they will say that anything that they disagree with is basically hate speech. I mean, there was an, an op-ed in the Harvard Crimson last year that it's not about academic freedom, it's about academic justice. And it was written by a very smart girl who basically says, you can say whatever you want as long as you agree with us. So how do you set forth those guidelines to say what speakers are just out of the realm and what speakers are, really constitute academic debate and academic discussion? Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. Okay. Alan, would you mind leading us off? Yeah, sure. I think alliances are hugely important. Whoever who asked that question, it's we, something we spend a lot of time working on. So we have an organization that works at the grassroots of the community, tackling BDS, not just in the campus, but in the cooperative movement and elsewhere. And they have a very strong relationship with the Christian community in the UK. 50% of the membership of We Believe in Israel is non-Jewish. And we build a lot of relationships that way, which is, which is really important. On campus, working with UGS and NUS, if it's in the trade union movement, working with trade union Friends of Israel and extending those links outwards with the Labour Party, Labour Friends of Israel and so on. So I think uh, it's absolutely right. We need to build those alliances. It's a, a crucial point. In terms of engaging with Israel with nuance and, and admitting complexity, I think this is hugely important as well. I want to quote a man who used to be a research fellow at BICOM, Tal Becker, who spoke here uh, yesterday morning. And Tal taught us. Uh, and, and has an expression which is that we need to be a character witnesses for Israel, not prosecuting attorneys if we want to win over audiences, as opposed to you know, make ourselves feel good. We need to admit complexity. We need to admit nuance. We need to not, not sound as if it's Israel right or wrong, Israel's a perfect state. We need to um, get, get past that. He has an expression, I should ex say it's his expression, not mine, which is if we're going to criticize Israel, it should be uh, as a mother does uh, to their child, not as a mother-in-law does, which is kind of, um, <laughs> which is nice to think. One of the things I think though about complexity is, is, is this on campuses, the most effective, one of the most effective arguments I find is, I spend a lot of time on campuses, Dublin, London, uh, Holland, I've been to Australia, New Zealand, debated this issue. The students think Israel has peace in the palm of its hand and just won't hand it over. <laughs> That's, that's where they think they're at. So if they can help pressure Israel to prise the fingers open, then everything's fine. We will have peace. So taking them through why that's not the case over the course of an evening is hugely important. To talk about Israel's security threats, 
They don't understand the topography of the country often. So physically, either with a slide or demonstrating with your hand where the West Bank sits above the population centers, what the distances are, the huge security. What happened when Israel withdrew from areas? The line I use often is, look, when is, why, you think, why, why doesn't Israel just get out? Well, here's the answer. Israel just doesn't get out because when Israel just gets out of somewhere, the record is Iran just gets in. You know, leave that hanging, then take them through the history. The pullout from southern Lebanon, the pullout from Gaza, the danger of a pullout from the West Bank. So taking them into that complexity, making them own it over the course of the evening so that they enter a different place, but that I think is hugely important as well. They simply don't understand the history. I agree with you. We have no, I don't agree with people who say, oh, well, let's leave the history alone and just focus on the future and so on. When you speak to an audience of, of students, some of whom have Palestinian scarves and badges and so on, and you say, do you know what happened in 1948? Can I just take you through it? And, and when you say there was a UN resolution and Israel accepted it and the Arabs rejected it, you can see them beginning to look along the line at each other. Well, they didn't tell us that. Do you know that five Arab armies invaded on the first day of the new state and 1% of the population died defending itself in a war of survival? after they'd accepted it. They don't know that either. So taking them through some of the history, the history which carries with it Israel's character as a, as a, as a country that's seeking peace, seeking mutual recognition and compromise in the region is, is really important. Last point on academic freedom. Um, we had a big debate in the UK recently about a conference that was um, proposed to help be held in Southampton University on the southern coast. And it was a conference organized by very anti-Israel academics. It was a conference of, of legal studies scholars which really wanted to say Israel is essentially a crime. It's essentially illegal. That, that was what they wanted to do. Um, there was a debate within the community about how to respond to that. And that debate is ongoing, and I think it's a reasonable one. My view very strongly is our strong ground is academic freedom and freedom of speech. And I, I think we don't do ourselves any favors if we vacate that ground and sound as if we're for academic freedom when it's about Israelis coming to campus to speak or Israeli ambassadors coming to campus to speak, but we don't really want academic freedom when the conference is, is very anti-Israel. I think we need to go along to the conference, argue, present papers to the conference. We need to be outside the conference with banners and placards relating to the media, telling them why it's a demonizing conference. But I think if we get into the terrain of saying we want to ban that kind of discourse, I think for myself, in principle, it's wrong, being a free speech person, but I also think tactically it's an error and the consequences are quite damaging. In this case, it was cancelled because on health and safety grounds, there was a kind of a fudge, but the other side really made the case that the Zionists and the lobby have banned the conference and they've been able to recruit a lot of people to their side on, on the strength of that. To, to make the point though this finally, what you then need to do is say, look, let's talk about who was organizing the conference. There's a man called Oren Bendor, who was one of the organizers of the conference. So some of us have gone and looked at his written materials, and we've produced a critique of them in our journal Fathom by a, a woman from Anglia University, and they are horrendous. He says that there's such a thing called Jewish being and, and thinking as an essence, and it's kind of a malevolent force behind all sorts of bad developments in the world, including the Holocaust. I mean, can you believe this? This is absolutely terrible discourse. So, it's our, so we've managed to expose it and then say to people, look, whether you think the conference should go ahead or not, this is the kind of thing that Jewish children are being expected to sit in seminar rooms and listen to and to take seriously. So let's break from that. If you think it should go ahead, fine. You think it should go ahead. But criticize this man. Criticize these views. Stand up for the Jewish students who have to, to put up with that kind of thing. So I think it's that combination of real tough engagement, real strong challenge, but respect for the principles of academic freedom that we should go for. Thank you. Kiva. <laughs> and we, we, I just, uh, not, not to cut you off in advance, but we are close to running out of time as well. Got it. So, so uh, I think that it's very important that the Jewish students have deep knowledge about topography and so on and so forth, but I explained to a whole group in detail and I think undeniable arguments why Israel is not an apartheid state. And the response from the group is, it makes no difference what you say, Desmond Tutu said it is. So this is the place where we are and we, we have to be aware of that. Regarding, I, I also, I agree with Alan, I don't think that we need to ban speakers. I think that North Korean diplomats, Iranian diplomats, Russian diplomats, and Israeli diplomats should be allowed to speak unimpeded on campus, 
and that, uh, and that uh, university students should be able to hear what they have to say. The problem is that right now, only the Israeli diplomats are not allowed to speak. That's, uh, that's, and so I think that where free speech works in our favor and is the correct thing. On the other hand, when you do have uh, uh, conferences about dismantling Israel, the university is not required to lend its name to that conference. Free speech does not require them to do that. And I just uh, uh, I cede my final 10 seconds to Larry Summers, because I think <laughs> that our major issue is that we need more university presidents to talk like him. He wrote, and I encourage you to read his two speeches. One was the address at morning prayers in Cambridge in 2002. He wrote, but where anti-Semitism and views that are profoundly anti-Israeli have traditionally been the primary preserve of poorly educated right-wing populists, profoundly anti-Israel views are increasingly finding support in progressive intellectual communities. Serious and thoughtful people are educating, are advocating and taking actions that are anti-Semitic in their effect, if not in their intent to demonize Israel and to, to use a standard that only applies to Israel. That is what, that, that is what we, that should be our standard, not for shutting people up, but for what position should be supported or not. And finally, he said in 2015, speaking at the Columbia Center for Law and Liberty, I believe that the general failure of American academic leaders to aggressively take on the challenge posed by the boycott divestment sanction movement represents a consequential abdication of moral responsibility. The American academic community is being implicated in uniquely persecuting the world's only Jewish state for sins that even on the least sympathetic reading are small compared to those of many other nations. We simply, this, is, this is the truth, really. And we need to get more university presidents to say it loud and clear. Alan, I see you edging to do, to say just, okay, so. Just, just in terms of materials, I should have said, I, I think the real intellectual underpinning of the BDS movement is the apartheid smear. The idea that Israel's an apartheid state. I spent some months writing a whole long pamphlet on this. It's called the apartheid smear. It's all online and you can, you can chase it up there. There's lots of tables and graphs and facts and figures that you can Thank use. You. Thank you. And um, I think that'll be helpful to people. It's an impressive document. Inclu actually, including yes. a great quote from Nelson Mandela, which you can use to combat best Desmond Tutu, where right. Mandela says explicitly, I support Zionism as a Jewish liberation movement. Mandela greater than Tutu. Exactly. The equation on that. <laughs> Eric, <it's> final word. <laughs> Just real quickly, I, I do want to say that there's a lot of great work going on on campus, building coalitions among uh, students of different faiths and different, uh, uh, and different backgrounds. If you look at, for example, the very successful effort against the referendum at Princeton, uh, you'll see that it was an example of that kind of building of a peace coalition. The same tactics don't work everywhere. Uh, you know, I've been in enough political campaigns in enough different states and cities and towns to say that the same thing doesn't work on one campus, it works somewhere else. But certainly those coalitions are, are effective and important. I want to say with respect to, uh, you know, just reinforce, uh, the, uh, you know, Jessica, th this, the, the outreach and the building of coalitions with progressive students is critical. It's an area we have to do more of. We have to take the time to do the history and the education. Um, and please, 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 let me ask you one question. Do you all believe the same things you believe today as you did when you were 20 years old? Do you, does everything you said when you were 19 and 20, would you wish to see today? So these are students, they're learning. Part of, their, part of the ethos of college is to rebel and to say things. Let's treat, let's educate them uh, and, uh, and, uh, and teach and not, uh, and not be quick. Uh, to condemn. Uh, we're named after Hillel and not Shammai for a reason. Um, you know, uh, and that is to be <laughs> inclusive uh, and welcoming and loving of our community, and, and we can do that on one foot. And the last, and the last thing, and the point about <laughs> academic freedom, I think there's, there's, we just have to make sure that we understand, and I think this is the point Akiva was making, there's a difference between academic freedom, and I actually don't worry about speakers and all of that kind of thing, but, but I do think the academic integrity of what is being taught uh, in coursework uh, and in classes is something about which we should care. Uh, and universities have a responsibility for the academic integrity 
uh, of, uh, of their materials. And anybody who works in the university environment knows how, how decentralized universities are and how much control over individual courses and coursework uh, you know, individual faculty members have. And that's why when you see certain disciplines have strayed so deeply into these, uh, into these uh, you know, anti-Israel swamps, that there is a legitimate concern about the academic integrity that is different than free speech and different than, uh, you know, than speakers on campus. Good point. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you all for being here. I apologize for everyone I didn't call on, but we know this is a discussion that will continue for some time. Thank you.